So welcome to a really fun interview. Uh, everybody seen the picture on this? No? Well, now you have to buy it. Um, but this picture, I mean, I think that John Hickenlooper could be Huck Finn's body double. <laughs> and I actually don't know what Huck Finn's body looked like, but the point is, with that goofy grin, it's, it's, a, it's a marvelous picture, and it's a coming-of-age novel, and that's what we're going to talk about today uh, for a few minutes, and then we'll... It's not really a novel. <laughs> it's intended to be more, more fact-based, like completely. That's fair. <laughs> I can't believe I said novel. I am corrected. All right. See, he likes me anyway. It's okay. Uh, so, I mean, I said this at a, at a few other uh, interviews during this week, but I am blessed to have very dear friends, one of whom is sitting to my left. And uh, we know each other well. We've done lots of uh, public events together. And uh, uh, I'm watching this happy chapter in his life with Robin, and I'm absolutely delighted about it. Okay, so this is a coming-of-age story, not a novel. Uh, and uh, it infuses, for those of you who are going to buy the book, because you want to hear this, uh, humor, uh, an acute sense of loss, a sense of wonder. I mean, look at, look at the name of it, The Opposite of Woe, and a lot of amazing stories. Uh, so I want to go through it a little bit um, with my friend John Hickenlooper, and he'll talk about the book, and then we'll take your questions. Uh, it starts out with a funny story at the White House, uh, very humorous, which you might want to tell. Um, well, I'll tell it, but uh, <laughs> uh, John and, and uh, then wife are invited to the White House uh, to the uh, Kennedy Center Honors, yes, and told that this is a presidential invitation. They ask 10 times, really a presidential invitation? So they go, they go to the East Room of the White House, which is the glamorous pre-party event, and they're sitting around there thinking, well, that's it. We're going to watch this thing on a jumbo screen, and oops, you know, mistake. And then, of course, they end up in the presidential box. That's a kind of John Hickenlooper story, isn't it? <laughs> but it starts beyond that. The book describes an acute sense of loss, the loss of a father at a young age and uh, the loss of a marriage uh, where both people tried hard. Uh, talk about that and how it is... Uh, and, and whether it has made you a stronger person. Well, it's, it's funny, and I, uh, I, my co-writer on this is a guy named Max Potter, who was my speechwriter for a couple of years, and he was the one who said, you know, you, if you ever wanted to tell your story, my dad was this remarkable guy, had these amazing stories in his life, but he was my mother's second husband to die, so she was widowed twice, and no one wanted to talk about my gregarious, funny dad, so I never heard any of the stories. I was... I was 46 years old when I, through chance, was, was talking to Kurt Vonnegut, who said, well, you can tell me what happened to my good friend, John Hickenlooper from Cornell. You have the same name. And I said, well, I was a junior, yeah, and, and he died in 1960. And all these things kept, kept coming up, and I always had this fear that my wild stories would never be collected for my son. So it started out as a way to, that Max was going to help me do research and put this all together. But as you get into it and you look at, you really do go back and examine all the stupid things you did. And we tried to make it as authentic as humanly possible. That trying to, you don't have to always try and just put out the rosy side of everything. And in the end, it, it, it sort of, I mean, I had to confront the kid I was. And I was a jerk. I mean, I was a skinny kid with thick glasses. And obviously, the, my father, the father loss made me obnoxious or made me more obnoxious than I probably already was. But, you know, I was a kid that got bullied in third grade and fourth grade. And if you ask anyone where I went to college, who was the least likely person to ever be in a position of elected to anything, they would have picked me. I mean, I was just a mess. And, and yet, I think the book, the, the, the part of the, of the book became, the goal was to, to really a, a call to action, nerds of America, yeah. nerds of the world unite. If, if you're willing to work at it and be persistent, you can play a role in addressing some of the tough challenges faced by your community and by your state and your country. And, 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 it's, and it's rewarding. And it's not always as bad as what it looks like okay. on, in the media. All right. But so let's wind back the videotape. You called yourself a dork, uh, for the record. The skinny dork with cold Coke bottles, thick glasses. 
must have been gorgeous. And you describe your romantic failures. It's all in there, folks. Uh, but so the skinny dork with the Coke bottle thick glasses goes to college, does actually get into college, and, and actually turned down Princeton, if I remember this, right? Well, my brother had gone to Wesleyan. Uh, my best friends up the hill, the Rural Millers, all went to Princeton. So I only applied to those two schools. I'd never, I never, I mean, I was, I'm dyslexic, so I was a, a poor student. I uh, had good board scores, but a, a very poor student. So I got put on the waiting list of both of them. And my mother, who had gotten a full scholarship to go and gone through Vassar College and loved it, she was so excited because this was the first year that Vassar was going to, going to admit women. I mean, admit men. First year they're going to admit women. Anyway, so this was this kind of, she immediately said, oh, I call, I know the director. And I, you know, she was on their alumni board. And the next day, Wesleyan admitted me. And the next day after that, Princeton admitted me off the waiting list, however those things work. And, you know, I said, well, Wesleyan admitted me first. I'm going to go to Wesleyan. Now, my brother went there and let, I'm, I, for a variety of reasons wanted to go. And my mother was like, but Princeton, I mean, you'll make an extra $10,000 a year for the rest of your life with a Princeton degree. I said, yeah, well, I don't know. It's not, you know, it's a little more buttoned down than I am maybe. And <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll just see what happens at Wesleyan. <laughs> so the skinny dork with the thick glasses, goes to Wesleyan, and ends up being a geologist. Explain this. Well, I, again, I tried almost everything. Uh, and I went through the first four years without <laughs> taking any math or science. I, I, I took... Aren't you loving this, folks? I took every... <laughs> I, I, I really wanted to be a writer, and I took all these creative... I took jazz piano, and I took all this stuff. Uh, how, uh, design and construction of stained glass windows. I mean... And at the end, my friends pointed out what a, what a poor writer I really was, and that this was not going to be a career in journalism or, or, or as an author. And literally, my last semester, I sat in on a, a class taught by, a, not by a professor, but a professional geologist at the US Geological Survey who was talking about land use planning. And it was, I took six pages of notes. I loved it. I came away and went and talked to him. I, literally, this is two months before I graduate. And Wesleyan had a special program for people with non-science backgrounds to get a master's in geology. And I just fell in love with it. And so I, they let me back in the next year as a special student. I took calculus and physics and chemistry. And it turned out I was kind of, I, I didn't take them when I was younger because, again, with the thick glasses and the acne, I thought I would never have a girlfriend if I was, you know, a science nerd. I was, so I thought if I was a musician or an artist, this would be much more appealing. It turned out to be completely wrong. Um, Obviously, the, my, my, my deficiencies far outweighed any tactical effort I could make. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I was good at science and math, and I loved geology. I loved continental drift. That the whole world was just awakening to plate tectonics and continental drift. Uh, I got to spend two summers mapping volcanic rocks north of Yellowstone Park, so I was, I'd go out for uh, almost two months and not see another person. Uh, it really was an amazing transformation where, that just kind of swept me away. Your personality was consistent with not seeing another person for two months? You know, that, 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 well, I had a field assistant. Uh, I had an old, the first year an old friend who was a painter, David Malden, and brilliant. He'd do a different watercolor every year. So I'd go off on a traverse and collect rock samples, and he would go up and just find a place and make these amazing paintings. So every night we'd come home and have dinner, and, you know, the, the landscape was so different than where I'd grown up in the East, and so... I, I just it was so powerfully <laughs> transforming me of, of how I thought of my life and who I was that it didn't bother me at all. The extrovert in me was subsumed. Is that the right word? Yeah. As an English major, I don't want to get those words wrong. Yeah. A former, well, I have my undergraduate degree is in English literature, so I got to get subsumed correct. This is just so wild. Okay, so you get employed. You have your master's in geology in Denver. Well, I, got, I had two choices. I, I finally got the, my master's in 1980. Uh, I was at Wesleyan off and on for almost 10 years. Uh, several of the professors got <laughs> together and, and got a piece of parchment, and they actually gave me tenure as a student. Uh, I'd, I'd been there so long. And the, uh, so when you have a master's in geology at that time, you had two choices. You could either work in Houston or Denver. And for a variety of reasons, that didn't take me long. I think it was maybe 15 seconds. Uh, to choose, because Denver was just cool. And it was, you know, it was a, uh, the West, but a different kind of West than Texas was. And I realize there are a lot of people from Texas. I'm not diminishing Texas. It's just Denver seemed so, you know, ready. It, it seemed like someplace that was going to really change and evolve rapidly. 
Well, that's the next chapter. But this chapter, Hickenlooper is hired. He's a geologist. Then what happens to the firm that employed you? Well, this was so I got. I, I came out to Denver in 1981 and had five great years in the oil business. Although it is a solitary. Nice. That's what the oil business was like back then. The lights were blinking. It was everything was happening. I had a company car. The dancing is starting shortly. <laughs> this is a. Uh, uh, a great opportunity. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the uh, uh, the price of oil collapsed in 1983 and 84. Uh, the company got sold in 1986. Everyone got laid off. Uh, we got severance packages. We had industrial uh, psychologists come and counsel us on on how to you know <laughs> all change involves loss. All loss needs to be mourned. Uh, uh -huh. But but again, I'd spent you know geologists spend most of their time not out in these beautiful landscapes, but mostly in a closed office making maps based on subsurface data from old wells. And it is a very solitary business. So I felt, you know, I had a, you know, I was going to get another job, but it turned out there were no jobs in geology. So then it's about beer. And that relates to a trip you took to Maine uh, while in college, I guess, or grad school. Yep. <laughs> and this guy you met. And falling in love with beer. Well, I, after my freshman year in college, where I almost had a girlfriend, and then she came to her senses, and I was so I was so devastated because I was psychologically unprepared for life. Uh, I I I drop I drop I was going to drop out, and my mother had a friend in Philadelphia who ran the summer work camp program for the American Friends Service Committee. So they sent me up to Washington County, Maine, Eastport. Uh, third poorest county in America to turn an old sardine factory into an alternative school. And there were 12 of us or 13 of us kids all just finished our freshman year of college from all over the country. And it was a, a, a we all lived in one big old farmhouse together uh, and had this incredible summer. And I stayed and taught as a teaching assistant at the school for uh, after everyone else went back to college. Uh, and the opportunity to get to know these people in this incredibly poor part of the country. But this one guy, Bob Shikofsky, and Bob and Lisa uh, had a bunch of kids and they, you know, they moved from Chicago back to, to Maine because they're just, they, they didn't like their jobs in Chicago and they'd rather have almost no money in Maine because you could live so inexpensively. But he homebrewed. And so he taught me how to homebrew and I went back to college and I, you know, had a special label of a big tree and a bunch of empty bottles and a guy kind of sleeping under the tree. We called it Hickenlooper Lager. You know, if, if you can't pronounce it, we won't serve you another one. <laughs> but, okay, so you have all these love affairs with occupations. So you're a geologist and then you're a brew pub guy. Are there similarities between <laughs> beer and geology or are you just enthusiastic about the next thing? Well, I, it's interesting that oil... And, and almost all oil, uh, when it's produced, has under pressure, you have natural gas in oil as you produce it, the, it bubbles out, it comes out. I mean, it's not that different from That's beer so with CO2 <laughs> under pressure. I knew he was going to say this. So That's I, not in the book, by I, the way. I, I actually, I think it's referred to, maybe not in the book, but it's, it's hinted at. Uh, <laughs> but I gave a lecture to, the, to Sigma Psi <laughs> about, my, about volcanology. And this was even before I knew I was going to ever end up in the beer business. Uh, but I, to show what they call the vesiculation of, of magma when, when it actually erupts and what causes all the little bubbles to form and makes it explosive is no different than when you shake a bottle of beer. And so, of course, to demonstrate this, I shook a bottle of beer uh, with the, you know, the chair of the biology department, the chair of the chemistry department, and the beer went pretty much everywhere, although they did vote me into Sigma Psi. So it, it, wa <laughs> it wasn't a complete disaster. But, it, but I think... I went from one liquid into another. And I tell people, oh, that's good. we sold our beer for, for $4 a pint. They're two pints in a quart, uh, four quarts in a gallon, uh, you know, 31, uh, 31 gallons in a, in a barrel. So we were getting about, I don't know, 650 bucks per barrel for our beer and just selling it over the bar in this brew pub. If the price of oil had been one-tenth of that, I would have stayed a geologist. So beer is the oil of the. Okay. Were you still a dork with your thick uh, Coke glasses, or had yeah. you gotten cute by then? No, I, I, uh, the miracle of LASIK surgery did not come my way until 2000. I see. So now you're a dork without the Coke glasses. 
You know, it's, it's funny, and, and uh, really thick glasses, contacts, for whatever reason, I could never get comfortable with contacts, but having big, thick glasses on your head, for me, was a psychological issue that was, it was difficult. I, I mean, I got, I'm an extrovert, I, got, I had friends, I did eventually <laughs> have girlfriends, but it was a hard thing when I, when I actually had, didn't have to wear glasses anymore, and I'm one of those lucky people, so one eye is kind of long, is nearsighted, one eye is- I have is the same thing, long, monovision. It, it's monovision, exactly. All the best and most brilliant people have monovision. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have monovision. See, I knew it was a smart audience. It is amazing. Okay, so tell us about the beer business. Well, the beer business, the, the great thing, I was in the restaurant business and the beer business. And the idea we were, we were going to create, go back to the pre-prohibition way of making beer. No additives, no adjuncts. You know, before that, they, before prohibition, they made almost all beer was almost completely made from barley. After prohibition was re repealed, it was in, it was 1933, in the middle of the Depression. So they used corn and other adjuncts, uh, rice, which made the beer lighter with less flavor, but it was cheaper to make. And mm -hmm. they, at that time they had refrigeration, so, and they'd artificially carbonated, so you got this real fizzy thing that was marketed to be drunk ice cold. I mean, would you ever drink a, a, a bottle of wine, even white wine, absolutely ice cold? You, you can't taste it. it, it numbs your palate. So we went back to the old pre-prohibition way of making beer, and uh, we decided we'd make all our food from scratch, no pre-processed cans of any sort, shepherd's pie with seven prep steps in every way. Uh, it was, that's probably better. Yeah, I think that's better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh -huh. um, anyway, that, that the, uh, the idea of, of, of a brew pub, going back to that traditional way of making the beer, was really appealing to me because I'd renovated, while I was working my way through graduate school, I loved old buildings, and I thought, ah, oh, what a great way to save a historic building. It's uh -huh. hard to restore historic buildings in a way that will generate enough cash flow to pay for that restoration, that renovation. Uh, so we went down to Lower Downtown Denver. And those of you who've been to Lower Downtown Denver, the beautiful old warehouses, right. but it was a ghost town. I mean, they were abandoned. This is 1987. And we signed a lease at the end of 1987 for $1 per square foot per year, just to have a sense of how bad the market was back then. Uh, and, or you know, how smart the negotiator was. <laughs> well, we, we ended up opening in, in 1988, and uh, you know, no one had opened a restaurant in downtown Denver in five years. And for me, the great thing was we went to the other five or six restaurants down there, and I started advertising. I put up little flyers in our vestibule for the Wazi Supper Club or McCormick's Fish, uh, Tavern, and my, my staff said, Hickenlooper, you're an idiot. You've never worked in the restaurant business. This is dog eat dog. You can't market the competition. The competition's going to eat you. And I said, well, maybe the real competition isn't these other restaurants, but is the TV set. And maybe our job is to get people off the couch and out the door to enjoy life with their family and friends. And if we do a good job and these other restaurants do a good job, more people will go out. And so we went and talked to the other restaurant owners, and they we agreed to start uh, chipping in to do group advertising in the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News and lower downtown we started calling it Lodo very hip for the West back in those days and lo and behold all of a sudden people started coming down and and when we'd done our research even though it was abandoned uh, there were no low-income housing projects there was not violence or crime it was a safe place to go after dark and all of a sudden it became hot so this is 1988 uh, 1991, Colorado got baseball. In 1992, the end of 1992, they decided they were going to build their stadium two blocks from our front door, which by this time I owned the building. I, again, my grandfather taught me everybody's got, you got to work hard your you whole really life. You really can't make this up. But it's, but it's better to be lucky than to be good oh, yeah. in the end. So they opened Coors Field in 95, but by that time we'd been in, in business for seven years and all these other restaurants had already opened. So Coors Field accelerated this urban rejuvenation, but it wasn't the cause in any sense. So how did you learn about business? Well, it's funny, I, and I was a natural entrepreneur, but back then no one ever talked about entrepreneurs, and you kind of, they, they were the ones that would try to start jobs and really never succeed. It wasn't a fashionable thing. You know, I was a kid when, in, in, growing up in Philadelphia, we'd go out and shovel sidewalks when it, when it would snowed, and part of my job, I had these other kids would come help me shovel, and we split it, but they didn't want to go talk to the owner of the house. So they just wanted to make sure they made their three bucks an hour. 
So I said, all right. And so I'd pay them their three bucks an hour. And all of a sudden, the people in the house were willing to pay me 12 bucks. And I'd only have to pay these guys six bucks. And suddenly I had a little business, you know, that Nat translated into mowing lawns. And, you know, that, that I'd had that gene, but I didn't know anything about business. And when we decided we wanted to do the brew pub, uh, a part, my old friend of mine and I went down to the library and got, got out a book on how to write a business plan. That was the name of the book. And I didn't know what the word pro forma meant. And I mean that. I, had, I was clueless. I was a geologist. Uh, and we just, we got friends who owned restaurants to open their books to us. Uh, we figured out how a business worked, you know, from the most basic elements. Uh, and when we opened, we made a lot of stupid mistakes, right? But we paid attention and we, we got, when we made mistakes, we figured it out. I mean, the one thing we learned within a couple months, which was turned out to be so applicable later in life, was that there's no margin in having enemies. There's no profit in having people really ticked off at you. And you learn within a few months that that person, when you say, oh, I don't care if you're unhappy or not, you're, you're being unreasonable, I I, and you walk away. That person goes out and says rotten things about your restaurant and your, who you are, you know, time after time after time. You never hear about it until it's way too late, until that whoever they're telling has told other people. And, you know, if we had a little more of that in politics, it probably wouldn't hurt, that sense of there's no margin having enemies. Uh, yes, let's applaud that line. We're getting to the good part about politics. Okay, so explain how the dork geologist brew pub owner uh, gets recruited to run for mayor of uh, uh, Denver in a, and decides to do it in a very crowded field. Well, we were it, actually the start was the taxpayers had passed a bond to build a new football stadium for the beloved Denver Broncos, and the old Mile High Stadium was falling apart. And then halfway through construction, they decided for, for, it turned out very good reasons, but they couldn't make them public, that they were going to sell the naming rights. And one of my friends and customers said, well, that's unfair. How could they do this? And, you know, I went and, and, and got interviewed by a Denver Post reporter, and they said, local businessman John Hickenlooper thinks this is an outrage. Well, all of a sudden, more people coming into the restaurant, people coming over and saying, you know, we agree, and they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't sell the name. And one of my customers did polling for, for political parties and candidates and initiatives. And so he said, if, we could, if I had three or $4,000, I could add a few questions onto one of these other polls and see whether taxpayers would be willing to pay the extra money. It turned out to, you know, four, it was $4.24 a year. If the taxpayers were willing to pay that, we could keep the name Mile High Stadium. Now, for other reasons, this was not a good choice for the stadium district, which was made up of all the, you know, one representative from all eight counties. That's who actually owned the stadium. Or the Denver Broncos, who would, they would split the, the revenue from the selling the naming rights. So this was not embraced by either the Broncos or the stadium district. And I thought, you know, we, we came out with this poll. We did a little press conference out in front of the stadium. Basically, I thought there'd be a crowd there. There was no crowd. There was, you know, the, uh, reporters from the three newspapers and, and TV cameras from the five TV stations. But we, we did our pitch. We gave out the poll. Seventy percent of the people in Metro Denver were happy to pay the extra $4.24. Nobody, no tax has ever rated that high in history. This was a beloved name. All of a sudden, we were on the front page of every newspaper, every TV station. And, and again, two days later, nobody cared, right? It was over. And, and, and we'd made this great thing, and months went by. And this is the funny part. The mayor, Wellington Webb, was the, the mayor of Denver, and he had supported building the stadium in downtown Denver. It's a regional tax, a sales tax of one-tenth of one percent. And the governor at the time, Bill Owens, who's a Republican, had opposed the tax. Well, the stadium district were all from, you know, it's all, most of the counties were Republican. Uh, they were all rural, you know, suburban, not rural, but suburban counties. And Denver was the big liberal bastion. Well. So they all decided once the construction got close to completion, they wanted to take the TV camera, uh, TV station through and show how great this stadium is going to be. They called up Governor Owens and had him be the face on this tour, even though he'd opposed the tax. Well, Mayor Webb is watching in his office, and he has a heart attack. He has a fit. And so he calls up. He gets his communications guy to call me up. He says, what's the name of that guy? Chicken Cooper or Poopin' Scooper? What was, you know, find that guy who had that pole. And he calls a press conference. I'm, I'm at a conference in Portland, Maine, but I come back from the Brewers Conference, and we have this big press conference in his office, and in this one, there are 100 people, and there are you know, journalists from all over the place. There are nine or 10 TV cameras, and suddenly, the whole thing stops. I mean, he says, some things shouldn't be for sale. He, uh, it was amazing that the whole thing, and in the end, we got a compromise. It, was, you know, it's, it became Invesco Field at Mile High, so we had Mile High in the name, 
uh, and many people still call it Mile High. After that, all these people said, Mayor Webb, in, in two and a half years, he's going to be term limited out. You love this city. You're a small business person. You should run for mayor. And I had all these customers around the bar who all, every city council member was a bum. Every congressperson was a bum. They're all, the mayor's an idiot. And I kept saying, they are us. This is an American democracy. If you don't like it, why don't you run? I kept encouraging people to do this. Nobody, nobody would take me up on it. And so somehow, that, I'm not sure exactly how the rest happened, but they flipped it on me. And I ended up being the guy running for mayor, nonpartisan seat, uh, you know, in, in, in Denver, Colorado. But it was a crowded field. And in spite of your recent no notoriety, you were not the top of the pack on day one. And you did something truly amazing. Everybody listen up. Again, everyone hasn't read this yet. Um, you engaged in a positive ad campaign. I know that sounds like an oxymoron. <laughs> Think about that. Positive political ad campaign. And it's worth describing a couple of them because they made a huge difference and moved you to the top. And when I first decided to run, and there were some friends who were political consultants and really savvy guys, and when I said I would not do a negative ad, two people got up from the table, there were probably eight people at the table, and said, well, good luck, because you're not going to have a prayer. There are five lifetime political leaders. That you've got the former uh, uh, auditor of the city of Denver, who's Latino. You've got the Pentate, the former African-American state senator, who's a brilliant orator. You've got Sue Casey, the former city councilwoman, who understands policy inside and out. You're going to get crushed. And I said, I don't care. But, you know, we're going we're gonna to run a positive campaign. So we, we made a couple of very funny ads about what we call the fundamental nonsense of government. The revenues had gone down after the, the 2000 dot-com bust, and the, the city had decided to raise parking meter rates, despite all the local businesses saying, wait, when business goes down, you don't raise the cost of getting to the business. You're, that you're just going to make, make it go down even further. But they went ahead and did it. So I did one of the ads was having a, uh, this wonderful a friend who is a perfect character actor walking around giving parking tickets. And I would come up at the last minute and put a quarter in and, and, and keep him from writing the ticket. And then we took the shots from like uh, Gary Cooper in the, some of those, you know, those old westerns where I was kind of walking into the sunset. Uh, they were just goofy, funny ads. The first one was me trying on different clothing because people, the voiceover was, now I'm running for mayor. Uh, and people tell me I have to look more mayoral. And despite my, my wife, Robin, is here in the front row, she's working very hard to make me look a little better these days. And it's had great yeah. success. Uh, but back then, it was a, that would have been an impossible challenge. Anyway, these funny ads. And I would go out and talk about a positive campaign. And, and I still talk about it. I've used this language for, for almost 13 or 14 years now, where in business, you never see or very rarely see direct negative ads. And of, I know of no two companies that dislike each other more than Coke and Pepsi. All the way through their cultures, they just don't get along. And yet you never see Coke do an attack ad against Pepsi because it would work. Pepsi's sales would go down. They would have no choice but to do an attack ad against Coke. Coke would counterattack against Pepsi. Pepsi would counterattack Coke. You would depress sales in the entire product category of soft drinks. But what we're doing is we're depressing sales in the product category of democracy. Right. And people are turning off, tuning out, especially young people. And, you know, this is the best form of government of anything out there, but it is fragile. And if we keep pushing people out of democracy and out of paying attention, uh, we do so at our own peril. Well, you've just... You've just described the business model of getting elected to the United States Congress. At the federal level, that is exactly what happens. And it turns off voters, and the extremes in both parties have disproportionate power because they're the folks who uh, thrive in this kind of environment. And both parties do it. Uh, don't think that only one party does it. And the negative ad is the ad of choice, and it's ugly, and then the retaliation comes. And uh, so much of Congress now is blame the other side for not solving the problem. Because if you work with the other side, oops, you're bipartisan and you're just uh, dog meat in, in, in your own primary. And even in the general election, that's not really rewarded, uh, which is a tragedy. So let me just ask another question about the mayor and then the governor's race and, or, or, and then the issues you're working on as governor and we'll all ask other questions. So you become the mayor of Denver, which was not the most forward-leaning town 
back in the day. I know you revived the downtown and the stadium had come and so forth and you loved architecture. Um, but it seems to me that the face, the sky, the skyscape of Denver changed on your watch. And I know one thing that happened was uh, several amazing art museums uh, came to Denver. And one uh, was an art, is, a, is a museum dedicated solely to an artist named Clifford Still. And that story is worth telling. Well, Clifford Still was one of the, by any measure, one of the two or three founders of abstract expressionism. And about after, and he was selling his, his large paintings for a, a million dollars back in 1970. And he just got sick of the whole New York art scene. He, he said, uh, it's, he, he said that, uh, that, that, that art galleries and art museums were like uh, mausoleums that, and that they ruined art. He thought there should be some natural light, even filtered or reflected, uh, and it shouldn't always be the same light all day. I mean, he was very opinionated. He stopped selling his art. He basically went underground. And when he died, he left a one-page will, leaving 850 major works of art. And uh, I think he had another 1,500 or 1,600 drawings and small works. It would be left to an American city that was willing to meet, create a separate museum solely for his work. They would not loan his work out, would not allow other work to be uh, brought in. He felt that abstract expressionism was based on uh, he was painting an interior landscape of his emotional life. And that he thought, if you go to the, to the uh, Met in New York, and in their uh, contemporary wing, they have you know, two Rothkos and two Rauschenbergs and one Pollock. You walk through the room, uh, the Clifford Still Room, to get in there, and there are nine major works there. And he felt that that was really the, the only way to understand abstract art was to surround yourself with several works by one artist. Anyway, all these cities had tried and failed to deliver to his widow, Patricia, uh, that, that, that she would sign off on, their, on that city because they all connected it to their art museum or, or one of their other art museums or they were going to have uh, simultaneous boards. And she said, it's nonsense. And so the director of the Denver Art Museum, Louis Sharp, was a friend of mine. I'd been on their board for six or eight years. And he said, he told me about this and said, you know, let's go visit her. And I was going to be in Washington anyway. She lived... Uh, uh, on, a, on a, old, a wonderful little farm about uh, 80 miles west of Baltimore out in, in, in Maryland. So he went and she, this old farmhouse, almost no furniture, hundreds of rolled up canvases and just sitting there. And we spent, you know, the better part of a day unrolling and talking to her about it. And I, you know, my pitch was, you know, Clifford Still was a true revolutionary. He was a person who's really thought the future should, you know, he was going to be defined more by the future than by the past. And that's what he just lived in that in the future. And that's what Denver is. And, the, you know, I knew enough people that we could raise the money and build a museum separately without any connection to the, to the Denver Art Museum. Uh, and it's funny. That conversation led to another, a couple phone calls. And then she came out to Colorado. We met again. And after about a year, we, she gave us five years to raise whatever it was, the $30 million to build a small museum just for Clifford Still. And, and we did. And... We did, when she died, she left her artwork. She had about 120 beautiful big paintings. And hers didn't have the same restrictions. In other words, that we could never sell it or we could never show it. She, she did, wasn't quite as strict. So before we opened the museum, uh, with the Clifford Stills, two daughters both signed off on this. His nephew, who's a, uh, a brain surgeon in, or a brain doctor in, in Denver, everyone signed off. We sold five of his paintings at Sotheby's for $110 million. So that allowed us, A, to prove that this is a major artist, and B, to endow the museum so that it can put on all these amazing programs. And it has. It's been a big part of Denver. It's wonderful. How many of you have seen it? How many of you have been there? Oh, wow. That's a lot. Well, this is a highly informed audience. OK, so fabulous success as mayor of Denver, recruited to run for governor. Uh, we can't cover all the issues, but let's go back to the to your ad campaign. You get slimed in the race for governor, and what does your response ad look like? Well, we we did an ad just to we figured the best way someone's going to attack you, just like judo, try to use their own momentum against them. So we did an ad where I get in and out of the shower uh, in a different suit of clothes or without a suit, with just a, a shirt and blue jeans or shorts, but I'm I'm. Each time I'm getting in, in and out of the shower, the voiceover is going, 
every time I hear these negative ads, it just makes me feel dirty. I feel like I'm covered in sleeves. I just want to take That's a shower. I just want to get clean. Uh, and you still see the ads still up on YouTube. People loved it. The fact that we weren't going to do a counterattack and go after uh, our opponents. We were just going to stay positive and talk about the positive vision for the state. Uh, and it, you know, it works. It, it, obviously, you, you've got to thread a needle. And in some of these elections, I think the, 50, uh, the, the 531s, uh, it's not 530, I'm thinking 501s. 501c3? No, no, but no, right. no, just the opposite. The, the, uh, the PACs come in and they attack your opponent in the same way that the other, which one? F 527. 527. 527. That's how innocent I am. I couldn't even get the right number. Um, although, I, honest, I do know what 527s yes, are and how do. they work by this point. So, um, second term as governor, uh, difficult re-election because you had signed the gun loophole bill and you were strongly opposed uh, by some of the gun interests, but you won. Um, some big issues, fracking, guns, I mean, that had to be an issue, uh, weed. Uh, everybody who hasn't seen this yet, Robin, you weren't here when I was bragging that this was my Robin Hickenlooper shirt. All right. Uh, and uh, how about uh, skills training for kids and retraining for older people? How about some of those issues? What, what are you working on? So let me just, because I think the gun one really is further evidence of some of the, the problems and decay that we have in this country. And I think most of you probably know this, but I, I had a lot of, having been on the board of the Art Museum, I had a lot of Republican supporters that were traditionally big donors to the Republican Party, and they weren't proud about it, but they supported me and raised money for me. And uh, the chair of the Denver Art Museum is a guy named Fred Hamilton, who's a, just a wonderful person, and we got to know each other very well. And he's been a finance co-chair of every campaign I've ever done. And I called these folks up and I said, universal background checks. We only get to half the gun purchases. Shouldn't this, doesn't this make sense after we had the shooting in Aurora? And we'd already, we, we doubled the, the funding we were giving to mental health. We recognized mental health was a big part. But keeping guns out of the hands of dangerous people seemed like such a good idea. And all the, every Republican I talked to said yes. Uh, now, the elected officials, the elected Republicans in our General Assembly were just the opposite. Every one of them said no. Uh, and we know we saw the polls. 86% of the total population of Colorado supported universal background checks. So we went ahead and took the national statistics and kind of ran this, put a, a piece of legislation, and put it in play. And we had trucks and cars circling the state capitol and honking their horns all day long. We had planes flying over with banners. I mean, this was a big commotion. And I remember coming home one night, my son Teddy, who at that time was 11. So he was in, in, in sixth grade, and I made the mistake of complaining to him, big mistake. And he looked at me and goes, Dad, what do you do at work all day that's so hard? Make decisions? He goes, he goes Daddy, get the facts, make a decision, check, next. I go, well, Dad, Teddy, that's not, he goes, Daddy, get the facts, make a decision, check, next. Every day I go into school and I have to learn something completely new I didn't know existed the day before. If I don't get it completely right, the next day is misery because everything's based on the day before. You know, after five minutes, I said, you're right. Sixth grade is harder than being governor. <laughs> but, but I came in the next morning, and, and, I, and, it, and it dawned on me that we hadn't gotten the facts in Colorado. We had national statistics for universal background checks. But I called up public safety, and it took them a couple weeks. So by this time, we'd already suffered the bloodshed of a, of a really divisive issue. And I've memorized these statistics. I think in 2012, getting to half the gun purchases, there were 38 people who had been convicted of homicide who tried to buy a gun, and we stopped them. 133 people convicted of sexual assault, uh, 620 burglars, 1,300 people convicted of felony assault where somebody ends up going to, to, to the hospital. There were 420 people that had judicial restraining orders not to see their former boss or their spouse. Uh, they tried to buy a gun, and we stopped them. And, and all my Republican elected officials had said, well, you know, crooks aren't stupid. Why would we pay a $10 fee and wait 20 minutes when, when crooks are never going to do this? 238 people, when they came to pick up their new gun, we arrested them for an outstanding warrant for a violent crime. Lo and behold, crooks are stupid. So... Um my dear friend, uh, Senator Susan Collins of Maine, a Republican, has been trying to get a Senate vote on a, on a bill called no, no Fly, No Buy, limited to 
a suspected terrorist who were on the no-fly list. Her thought is that after Orlando, just maybe those folks ought not to be able to uh, buy guns. The guy, the shooter in Orlando, had been on the no-fly list uh, in the past five years, and that's what it applies to. You got any advice for her? <laughs> um, well, I will say that trying to persuade people, the one thing I did learn in the restaurant business is when someone's angry, repeat their same words back to them. It always mollifies people to hear. They feel validated. They feel respected. So, you know, repeat back what they're upset about. And then the second thing, the only real way, and, it, and, and this took me several years in government. Really, I was, I was a, uh, my second year of being governor. The way to persuade people who disagree with your position on an issue is not to tell them why they're wrong and not to tell them why your ideas are better. That almost always pushes them further away. Uh, and I, I saw this in action uh, with a, a young woman from Durango, Colorado, who we put on the, the Public Utilities Commission. And she was very clear. She said, the way to persuade people is just to listen to them and continue asking questions about the issue. Ask about questions from every different direction. And the more they talk about it, the more they will get away from a narrow, fixed position. And if, you ever have, if you're going to have any hope of persuading someone, listening to them is a much more effective solution. I, if I was going to give Susan, I mean, I think that's a steep hill because the, the Republicans have dug in, but I, it's certainly worth doing. Yeah, well, 90% of the country's for the bill, but sadly, not 90% of the Senate. Um, I want to get to questions, but I have, I have uh, just two more. You spoke very well the other day at uh, Zoe Baird and Bill Buttinger's house about the skills training that you're doing in Colorado. It's very relevant as we think about all the anger in the country uh, about those displaced by globalization. And it's palpable anger in both parties. Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump have uh, a feed off this as part of their, their support system. And it's a real issue. I mean, it's, it's not a pretend issue. So what is this skills training approach and how will it hopefully help Colorado, um, not uh, Colorado jobs remain and grow? Thank you. And it, this is something uh, of all the stuff I've worked on is very exciting. I think part of the anger we see in politics right now, uh, I mean, the strong support, I'm sure people in this room, strong supporters of, of Donald Trump, hopefully not many of you. I, I, I bring a certain bias. Uh, I did hear last night that, that he is, that finally has prescriptions uh, uh, for Prozac for his, for Hispanic attacks. <laughs> Sorry. That was terrible, but... Oh, did you say that at comedy night last I night? did, I did. Oh. Um, but I think, I think his, his appeal and, and a lot of the, uh, of the extreme appeal that many people, I mean, we've all been surprised at the depth of that yeah. anger. We are going through such a period of, of job dislocation right. and huge numbers of industries and careers have been marginalized. So we've been looking at how do you, right side by side with that is the fact that Forty years ago, this country began a campaign to get more kids to go to college. Uh, Seventy percent of the kids in the old days uh, never got a four-year degree. Uh, only 30 percent did, or, you know, 29 and a half percent. So we've been, for 40 years, we've spent hundreds, I don't know, tens of billions of dollars, probably hundreds of billions of dollars. We've had a national, we, we've been so focused on this, we've, we've made it look like being a plumber or an electrician is not a good career for anybody. And you know where we are now? We're almost at 31% of people that will graduate with a four-year degree. It's been a, a, a failure. So we looked at the Swiss apprenticeship model. Uh, there's a guy named Noel Ginsberg. He's a CEO and owner of a company called, that's a plastic injection molding company called Intertech Plastic. Uh, he is, for the last three years, been donating 30, 40, 50 hours a week to create an apprenticeship program that's going to allow kids to go to work at, you know, when they're 17, beginning their junior year, go to work at a company for three days a week, and then two days a week go to a, a community, well, or a, a, a workforce training center or community college and take classes that the two days of study are going to be designed by the industry in which he's working to help him grow as a person and, and become a good citizen, but also be more successful in his career. And they get to choose this. Uh, the the advantage of this, and, and in Switzerland, I mean, it's not just trades, it's banking, it's insurance, it's advanced manufacturing, it's aerospace. They do this for every industry there is, pretty much. It's an it's a accepted way of life. UBS, the largest bank in Europe now, their CEO was an apprentice. 
Didn't get his college degree until he was like 26 or 28. He did it working his way up the, the, the ranks in UBS. So we've been looking at that simultaneously to that on a different track. Uh, the Markle Foundation, Zoe Baird, has been remarkable in, in helping envision this. But creating a website, uh, and, and the website's called Skillful. It's up. It's very rudimentary. But you'll be able, kids will be able to click on a community college class, a workforce training program, anything, and see what skills, what competencies they'll end up with if they succeed, if they finish and complete this class. Same thing with college courses. Uh, if let's say that uh, Walmart uh, gives a nine-month badge for people that learn inventory, that'll be up on this on this website, so kids can click on it. And you click on a. a, a, a a community college class, it shows you the skills and competencies you'll get. You click on those skills, it'll show you the kinds of jobs that'll prepare you for. You click on the kind of jobs, it'll show you who's hiring and, and, and how much you get paid. So this combination, also the LinkedIn part of it will allow kids to have a, a living resume that follows them through life, where they accumulate all these different skills so employers, potential employers can see, oh my God, that's exactly what we're looking for. And you say, well, is that really going to be a difference? I think, the, and the reason I brought up Donald Trump, we've had so many people so unhappy over losing their careers. You know, they're making half of what they made 10 years ago, and they're, they're, they're pissed off. They're, they're frustrated and angry about it. And I think that there's, a, a, if we can scale this successfully, uh, people who've lost their careers can go on to Skillful and see, here are the skills I have. What are the kinds of jobs? And the example I use all the time, we have probably half as many bank tellers as we used to have 10 years ago. And you look at the skills they have, basically they have to be numerate, high sense of precision, uh, they have to have a sense of urgency, they have to work well with others, they have to have customer service skills. Well, Colorado is a big, a big leader in cybersecurity. We have 5,000 empty jobs right now. We have 85 private companies down in Colorado Springs because of Spacecom and their leadership in the military and cybersecurity there. And we can't fill these 5,000 jobs. Three quarters of them, you don't need a master's or a PhD or even a college degree. You, know basic, you need to know basic coding. What do you think the skills are that they're looking for for someone to take that nine-month coding class? They need to be numerate, high sense of precision, have a sense of urgency. They have to have a customer, uh, a collaborative nature of working with other people and, and good customer relations. It's exactly the same skill set. I'm not saying all all bank tellers could be, uh, could be uh, coders or go to work for a cybersecurity company, but starting jobs are like fifty-five dollars or $60,000. It's a great opportunity of looking at how do we scale uh, opportunities for people that have lost their careers for these emerging careers that are just starting up. Well, like an unemployed geologist becoming a brew pub owner, becoming a mayor and a governor. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions, and if you could ask a uh, a, 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 use a simple declarative sentence for your question. We'll then get to a lot of you. There's a woman right here in red. I just would like to know what the same we have a microphone coming so everybody can hear you. And please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Marcia Reisman from Miami, and I work with kids who are aging out of foster care. And one of the hardest things is they have very few skills, but they don't even have a clue how to deal with whatever they know. And I'd like to know how to get in touch with that person who's developing this kind of program. It sounds like it would work. Right. So his his name is Noel Ginsberg. I don't have his email right, but he'd be happy to. I he's, probably do. Is he, it on he's here? easy to get a hold of. It's it's the uh, oh. So Connor Hall is my wrangler. They used to call him in politics someone who keeps you on schedule. They used to call him the body person. I thought that was inappropriate. So we, we refer to him as our wrangler. But if you, okay. we'll make sure you get his email and that he can connect you. Because Noel is, I mean, as, especially foster care, one of the biggest challenges we have of, and we're trying to use promotional means now to get, it's amazing how many people that want to have children and haven't been able to, especially as people wait longer to get married, they'd never have thought about foster care. So we're try, trying to figure out how to market using social media and, and even TV ads to get more people to think, consider adoption of kids in the foster care system. Um, yes, I think you already hold the mic, yeah. so. Hi, we'll Bob, over here. Bob Mack from Denver. Uh, I, I, Colorado is one of the few st early states to deal with this whole marijuana issue. I wonder if you have any data that shows the success 
or not success of the experiment. Sure, and I, it is an experiment. So I think one of the great social experiments, it'll be one of the, of the first half of the century for sure. I oppose it, but almost every elected person oppose it because you don't want to be in conflict with the federal law. I can't tell you what a nightmare it is. And, and to, I mean, even Amsterdam never legalized it. They decriminalized it. But to create a regulatory environment is a steep hill. Uh, I will say, and we were worried the kids would get, since the adults legalized it, more teenagers would take it, this high THC marijuana. I don't know about the rest of you, but in the book, I clearly smoked and inhaled marijuana in, in high school and college. And this stuff is 10 times we're more intense. We're shocked. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, the brain scientists are pretty much unanimous that high TAC marijuana, when your brain's still growing rapidly during your teenage years, it will take every time, even once or twice a week, you'll lose slivers of your long-term memory. And kids don't believe this. We were very worried we'd see a spike. We were worried people would drive while high. We haven't seen any of it so far. And uh, 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 one of uh, John Buxbaum, I know many of you must know John. I was talking to one of his sons. And I asked him, was he worried about other kids in class, you know, feeling that marijuana was okay, easier to get in some way? And he laughed. He said, it was always easy to get. Anybody who wanted to smoke it could already smoke it. And I don't think anyone thinks it's any safer or less safer. I don't think we've changed in that. But what you should understand, Governor, is if you're able to tax it appropriately to drive out the black market, get rid of the drug dealers, they don't care who they sell to. And that will be a positive step. And we're beginning to get anecdotal evidence that we are getting rid of drug dealers. And we're seeing less drug dealers in many parts of the city. Uh, we're going to take three simple questions, uh, in, lightning round, and then let I, uh, Governor Hickenlooper answer them all together. I have a simple question. I assume that smoking marijuana or whatever you did does not disqualify you for vice president <laughs> of the United States. <laughs> Would you discuss that, please? Uh, OK, wait. Let's take a few other questions while you compose yourself to yeah, answer uh, that question. I'm trying to find a note card. Uh -huh. uh, there's one over here. Thank you. And then there's one behind you, two rows, and that'll be it. Thanks, Governor. It's very cool. Um, and by the way, congratulations on your recent marriage. It's uh, very exciting news. Um, what I want to ask you about is nothing gets done in, in D.C. What you're describing for about Colorado is really quite extraordinary. Um, how much effort, uh, coordination, organization is there to talk to your fellow governors, um, mayors, et cetera, about trying to do these same types of things in each one of those jurisdictions? Okay, and one final question. Yeah, my name is John Flood, and I'm from uh, Tampa, Florida. What is the total revenue that the state has brought in since the legalization of our, uh, marijuana? Okay, three easy questions. And I'll be quick. Uh, so the, the VP thing, I don't think it really, uh, uh, I don't think it uh, unqualifies me, although I don't think I'm very far up on that list. Uh, I know, I'm, I, I was getting that. I, I do think there are other things in the book that if I had thought that I was, you know, if that book was meant to be an audition, maybe I should have left out the part about taking my mother to see Deep Throat. Um, <laughs> which was one of those, well, you have to understand, my mother had been widowed twice. I went off to college, and, and this is when X movies first came out. And we, we didn't know what an X movie was. I came home for Thanksgiving, and my mother had cooked this. I was going to go with my friend, Jed Rule Miller. We are going to go see the first X movie. We didn't know very much about him. We thought it might be a little racy. And my mom had cooked this big dinner, and I was going to tell her I got to leave in 50 minutes. So I, I felt this big, and I said, well, do you want to come with us? And she, in a, I, I mean, she was lonely. I didn't realize as the youngest of four kids, she had been alone in the house. She goes, yes, I'd like to come. And my mother was, you know, five foot and, and depression child, you know, sewed all her own clothes. And so we get into the movie theater, and, and the, first, the first scene is pretty raunchy. And <laughs> I look at her, and I say, I think we better go. And she looked at me, and she goes, no, this will be okay. <laughs> and, and, and at the end... At the end of the movie, the end of the movie is we're driving home, and I feel like the biggest idiot in the history of the world. And uh, I said, well, that was pretty awful, wasn't it? And she goes, I don't know. I thought there was some good character development. <laughs> so I should have left that out. I, I'm not sure this book is, was, was the right thing to do. Uh, uh, how much effort goes into uh, other governors? A lot. 
And governors, unlike almost everyone else, Republicans and Democrats, we get along. Uh, you, last year, uh, I finished just about this time. My, I had one year, the, I was the chair of the National Governors Association. And so we taught, were very competitive. And so the fact that when I first came in, Colorado really had some challenges. We were 40th in job creation. And now, by almost any measure, we're in the top two or three states. Job creation, startups, you look at the workforce, uh, best place to start a business. Uh, we're everywhere, and these other governors are paying attention. And we've, and I'm, you know, the one thing about governors, we love to tell everything we did, copy us. It's the, it's the greatest success is for another state to say, we're doing just what you did. Uh, we just started a program in Denver uh, last Thursday where we're actually setting up a structure. We call it the Governor's Fellowship to take rising young leader, leaders in the private sector, people in their 30s and early 40s, and they are going to spend one full day, and their companies are sponsoring them, but in a highly curated uh, curriculum of how to get them ready at some point to join public service. Because so many of our leaders are in business, we're not getting enough people in there. So anyway, other governors, they're hearing this, and, and I think they're working on it. Uh, total revenue in marijuana, uh, I don't know what it is since the beginning, but last year, full fiscal year, about $120 million, a lot of money. Our budget, a state budget, all the pass-throughs that we get from the federal government, it's about $27 billion. So it's a drop in the bucket, but we have been very careful to make sure all that tax money gets used for the unintended consequences of marijuana legalization, such as some kids, not all, but some kids really become intensely bipolar the first or second time they smoke pot if it's this intense stuff, and those mental health issues, they drop out, they run away from home. It's very expensive to address them and hard to raise money in government for those mental health issues. So we're putting it to regulation, public safety, uh, making sure we have a huge marketing campaign to make sure kids don't think it's a good idea when they're teenagers to be smoking this stuff. And I do think, I didn't finish this, if I'd had a magic wand back in the beginning when it, after it got passed and I could have reversed the vote, I might have done that. And now, you know, almost three years into the, this great experiment, I'd put that magic wand in a drawer because I think it might work. I think we might pull this off. And Lord knows the old system was a train wreck. And a, a new system, if this, we can pull this off, I, I think in the end it might be a much better system than what, what we had before. So this book is almost as wonderful as this guy. And, of course, I've been looking for the passage in the end about his wedding. And he reads, uh, what did you read here? You, you read, uh, what was the Teddy, quote? Teddy read it. Teddy read it. Ah, oh, well, here it is. And Teddy, 13 years old, dressed in his jacket and tie, my son poised to be a man who was not always will be my best man, did one of the readings. My heart swelled as I watched him walk to the podium near the altar, clear his throat, and read from the first letter to the Corinthians. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. And most of you have read this. Love never ends, etc. And And this is uh, the author. That reading could not have been more perfect for that day, and really, as far as I'm concerned, any day. It resonated with me. When I was in ch a child, indeed, I thought like a child. I'd go so far as to say when I was a young man, too often I thought like a child. But in time, I put away my childish ways little by little. I suppose if you had to put a date on it, it was the day I held Teddy in my arms for the first time. In short order, I became a father, then a mayor, then a governor, each one a gift filled with immense responsibilities, challenges, heartaches, and joys, each one requiring me to have faith and to hope, each one reminding me that the greatest of these is love. And now I was fortunate to have Robin in my life. Are we crying yet? <laughs> and a second term as governor and years to spend with Teddy. While this is where my story thus far ends, it is also where the rest of my life begins. Where we go from here, who knows? You know me, I've got a few more ideas in my head. Giddy up. Thank you all.